auction tonight. Yay. Uh, for those of you who I accidentally kicked off of live, I apologize. I hit the wrong button. I also changed the camera to my face, and I look sad. But we're, we're good now, so come back. For those of you who I kicked off, please come back. <laughs> well, I'm not talking to you guys on Facebook, but it's got a weird delay, so sometimes it feels like I'm not talking to anyone because there's like a weird 10 second thing. But that's fine. <laughs> I probably don't need that. <sighs> well, if you guys are watching on Facebook, uh, don't be afraid to let me know that you're watching. Uh, you drop a comment with your name on it, all that kind of stuff. If you need anything with like sound wise, you want the camera closer, just let me know. I will do my best to fix these. She says, saying that knowing she probably won't be able to fix it, but that's fine. What? If they need sound oh. louder or whatnot. Okay. Well, I will give people a couple of extra minutes. Uh, I need another note page. <laughs> uh, we'll give everyone a couple extra minutes to see if they join on Facebook. You can take everything in that, Mom. Um, yeah, this book has more than what mine does. Yes, I, I, I updated. Oh, okay. You can add that to another one. Um, those of you wondering what I'm saying to my mom, I have hard copies of some note sheets and some, you know, informational things that we'll be using in a couple next week and everything, but if you want the hard copies, uh, let me know. You can either drop a comment or you can email me, um, and I can put it in your mailbox for you to get Sunday, or I can mail it to your house if you can't make it here in person. I can send you a PDF file. Um, they'll be really helpful um, next week and the week after when we start actually taking the test to figure out what our spiritual goals are. Come on Facebook. So people are coming and they're leaving. People are coming and going. So I'll give it a couple more minutes. See what happens. You could go ahead and say a prayer. I'll open up in prayer and then we'll get started and everyone can join us. Dear God, thank you that we are able to meet here tonight or whenever it is that you know people will be watching this. Um, I know when they're watching it is when they're needing to watch it, so I'm thankful that they're tuning in when they can. Um, thank you for allowing us to gather together um, to actually study your word, to study your calling for us. Um, and just to understand, you know, what it means to be made in your image and what it means to, you know, be a child of God and to follow and to live Christ-like life. I pray that you be with us as we talk tonight, as we discuss things, um, and be with us as we take this information home with us as well. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, so as of right now, it is just a couple of people um, that haven't told me whether or not they're here with us, but that's okay. We will go on with it as we go. Okay, so, hi. Hi. <laughs> so last week we talked about, um, you know, spiritual gifts. This week we're going to kind of cover the last two of the three things that, you know, the class is mostly about. Um, we're talking about spiritual gifts, passions, and personality. So this week, or tonight, we're going to be talking about passions and personality types. And what they mean, why we care about them, um, and stuff like that. Okay, so the first thing is, what does my personality 
personality mean? First off, what do you know about personality type? We know about personality at all. They can clash. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we all have different personalities and sometimes they're complete opposites. Which can be a good thing or a bad thing. So why do you think knowing your personality or understanding your personality is something we should talk about? Feel free to answer on Facebook too, guys. I know I probably, certain things I know about my personality will prevent me from probably stepping forward and putting myself in certain situations because I know I wouldn't be able to handle it. I'm like that too. Um, Other people are so for things that they never take the time to slow down. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I wanted to point out about personalities is that our personalities are not the same as spiritual gifts. A lot of people think that, you know, when you know one, you know the others. Uh, some people think what you're gifted at is the same thing as, you know, I like to do this or I like to do that. Um, and they're not the same things, but they do both speak into who we are and how we were created. Galatians 6, 4 through 5 tells us that we are to make a careful exploration of who we are and the work we have been given. And then we sink into that. One of the things that I love about this verse is that it's telling us that who we are matters. Understanding who we are matters. It helps us determine what we're, the work we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do it, why we're supposed to do it. And it gives us, you know, that like, yes, do it kind of calling card. Um, so one of the things about, especially with personality types, is that kind of goes along with the who you are. Your personality type is how you, you know, make decisions, how you take in information. That's literally what makes you who you are. I'm actually glad you brought up that verse because up until now, I mean, I have gone to personality seminars. I've taken the tests at every place I've worked at. They give personality and leadership assessments and all this in the business world. And I don't, that verse is not familiar to me. And so all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, why don't we talk about it more in the church and actually do this sort of thing so we know how to get along, how to work with each other, because we're with each other two, three times a week, just as we are with the people we work with and our family. Um, and when we're doing our witness together or our service projects or whatever, um, we need to know who we can work with, how we can work together and not just assume that because we're all Christians, we'll get along no matter what. So that's kind of eye-opening there, Stephanie, <laughs> that that's actually, uh, you know, um, a request. Well, yeah, it's, it's not just a request, but it's also, you know, part of wow. our mandate, you know, part of being called is being called to know who you are and where you fit in. You know, I think one of the things, um, you know, with this God Says series that Pastor Tim and also, Pastor Dallas have been doing on Sunday mornings is kind of diving into these kind of things. And hint, hint, Sunday, that's a little bit of what you know, Pastor Tim is going to be talking about, about how knowing who you are is a big part of knowing that you're called. And it goes in hand in hand there. All right. Our personality types tell us how we take information and how we make decisions. 
one of the reasons why so many people, you know, especially like my mom said in the business world, actually determine what, you know, go through the test, find out what their personality type is, is because it's a real eye-opener to tell you, okay, you're naturally going, you know, tended to do this versus this. You know, we take in information, we process it, and then we make decisions based off that information, and I do that very differently than a lot of other people. You know, and sometimes the things that make sense to me don't make sense to other people because we're not, you know, created to take in information in the same way. And so it's important to know how we do that so that we can take in information like, you know, what's in the Bible, take in information about what's being said in, you know, messages from, you know, our pastors and actually process what that means. We all process the world around us differently, meaning some people see connections that others do not and do not and vice versa. You know, one of the things about the puzzle pieces we're kind of, you know, using as kind of a visual for this, you know, class is that, you know, um, there are, you fit in a place that another piece doesn't fit. And that doesn't mean you're bad or doesn't mean the other person's bad. It just means that you're designed differently. You're created differently. And that's going to help you make connection that needs to be there that someone else probably wouldn't see. Understanding how our minds work helps us understand how and why we do what we do. Aligning this with the spirit then also helps us be more Christ-like. So one of the things about you know, being made in the Imago Dei is it doesn't just mean physically looking like God. It also means acting like God, thinking like God. And so our minds are a piece of God. They're created to reflect him. And so by understanding how our minds work and, you know, making sure that aligns with the spirit and what the spirit says to be and to do helps us put ourselves in a mindset like Jesus, a mindset like God, and actually live a life that's a little bit more Christ-like than before. The reason I brought this up is if you remember last week, we mentioned what spirituality was. We defined it. And that meant aligning our souls with our heart, mind, and body to fulfill our purpose. This is the same kind of thing. You know, it's not just, you know, understanding your spirituality, being more spiritually formed includes aligning your mind with the spirit, making sure your mind is as Christ-like as your actions are. And, um, and when you take that out, you're taking a piece of spirituality away from yourself. For those of you who are on Facebook, um, if you want to feel free if you can drop comments or questions, um, you can let me know that you're watching, um, when it is you're watching this, um, so that maybe I can answer that if you're here live. So remember, we were created in the Imago Dei. We each represent a part of who God is, and that includes our unique personalities. You know, as much as it pains me, my personality is just as much um, look, that looks like God as, you know, people who are the exact opposite of me. Same with their personality is aligned to God, even though I'm their exact opposite. And just because we do things differently doesn't mean they aren't acting like and thinking like God. Mm -hmm. Because they don't think like me doesn't mean mm -hmm. they don't think mm -hmm. like God. That's one thing about understanding your personality that is important is it's not all about us. You know, my personality, I like my personality. I think it's really good. I think it's really helpful. But it's not the only personality. And I can't think that my way is the only way. It's not. It's one of several infinite ones. 1 Corinthians 3.16 kind of helps that, I think, says... Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Now he's not, you know, writing this saying, Do you, don't you know, Stephanie, that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? He's saying you as in whoever it is that's reading this. You are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you. God's spirit is in all of us. 
And so everything we do and everything we say is supposed to represent God. And that means our personalities help us determine what we say and what we do. Any questions before I keep going? Tonight's not a lot of, I don't have a lot of many questions, simply because of the way this class is formatting. Most of you are online, but we're going to make sure we're all on the same page. Understanding how our minds work and what our personalities are also helps us relate to other people and helps us build stronger bonds with our community of faith and with the larger body of Christ. One of the things I love about knowing people's personalities is when I understand personalities and I know what you, your personality is, I get to understand that maybe what you're doing, even though it's different than me, what you're doing is right for you. Uh, one of the things that's really helped me is, you know, my family, for example. Me and my mom have very similar personalities. <coughs> my dad and my sister have very personali similar personalities. Them two versus us two are very opposite personalities. So whenever they do something, helping me know that their personalities are different than mine, very opposite of me, helps me kind of understand why they're doing it, so that maybe we don't clash as much. Still working on the clashing part, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we are all many members, but one body. This is the, you know, the beginning of, you know, the spiritual gifts passage in the Bible that Paul talks about. He always starts, you know, first... Corinthians 12 off with we are one body with many members just as we are, you know so, such and so, such there's a lot of words so that I can't quite remember them all right now <laughs> but the purpose is that we are all one body of Christ but we are all many members mm -hmm. and each member makes up the body in its own unique and important way when you think about the actual human body you can't say to the hand, why don't you do what the foot does, and that you're not good anymore. The hand and the foot do two very different things, but you can't, you know, you need that in order to function with the body. Same goes with our personality types. Each member has its own job, its own way of thinking, way of doing, that we need in order to function as the church the way it's intended to. Mm -hmm. All right, so, what are the different personality types? This is a very loaded question, and that's because there are multiple different tests mm -hmm. that you can take. Um, Mom, what do you think, what are some examples of tests maybe you've taken before? Well, I know there's the letter, where there's a type A. Yep, type A, type B, personality. Yeah. There was also one that had, I think, it was a four square type thing, and I think there was, there's, well, you've heard of introvert and extrovert. Mm -hmm. I think there was one, oh man, that maybe had an E and an I, a D, there's the dominant, there's the, what was the fourth one? I can't remember. But anyway. Yeah, but there's, so there are a lot of tests, right? There are a lot of tests. Well, some of the examples I have not personally taken all of these, but have seen before. There's the disc one, which is, uh, there are four different categories, squares, and each one has its own thing. There's the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Oh, That's yeah. A popular one. This is the one where you get four letters. Um, one is oh. either E or I. Yes. One is either N or S. And you go through and... Yeah. Yes, that's the one I was yes. thinking of. Mm -hmm. There's the Enzyme Personality Inventory. I have never taken this one, but you know, possibility. Oh. Another one that's not up here, but there's one called the color test. And so you, you get assigned a specific color that kind of helps you tune into your personality. That's a pretty, I have taken that one. I didn't put it up here. The e block test is an actual personality type uh, test. Because really? What you see in the inkblot helps determine what your personality is. How they determine it, I have no idea. Um, a recent, you know, fan favorite one, especially for those of us who have 
Brett College, is the Enneagram. The Enneagram, you get a number assigned to you between one and nine, um, and it completes a circle. So one goes to, goes to the next, and your number, you kind of lean toward one, you lean towards the other. Um, in the Enneagram, for example, I'm a six, which means I'm a loyalist. Um, my mom's making the face like she has no idea what the Enneagram is, so she's also a six. I made her take this, I made her take this test once. I made my family oh, take this test Oh, yeah, once. you're right. Well, I don't remember what it was called, but I do remember. <laughs> yeah, number six. Yeah. Um, so that's a good one. But for the purposes of tonight and in two weeks when you take the test, we're going to be focusing on the Myers Briggs. And the reason for that is because I have a book that I have been using that really helps you. When you know your Myers Briggs, it helps you use it in the church specifically. It helps you know, okay, this is your personality type. These are some good practices for prayer, good practices for study, good practices for worship, service, all sorts of things. Um, and so I, I'm going to recommend that book to you. And we're going to use the Myers Briggs to kind of help you with that. So, regarding the Myers Briggs, this is kind of how the Myers Briggs is set up. You're assigned four letters. Um, various combinations of those letters give us 16 different personality types. Um, then you know what each one represents. Your first one is you're either on the scale an extrovert to one side or an introvert to the other. You can land anywhere on this scale, but you know, it tips one way or the other. And it refers to how a person is energized. What that means is I love being with people, but in order to recharge myself, I need to have some time on my own. Without that, I go a little stir crazy. I'm an introvert. People who are extroverted cannot sit in a room by themselves too long without getting really dragged down. And they need to go out and be with people to kind of pep themselves back up. They're extroverted. Another scale is the sensing or intuition, or the N or S. It tells you are first to what a person pays attention to. So how you take, um, or not how you take information, but how you, you know, perceive information. Another one is thinking or feeling, which refers to how a person decides something. You know, once they've taken in information, once they've processed it, what they do. And then the last one is judgment or perception, which refers to the lifestyle a person adopts. So after they've made a decision, how then they then follow it through into their everyday life. Um, we'll go a little bit more in depth with this um, when you guys actually take the test in two weeks to determine your personality types. Um, there's a little, you know, chart if you get a hard copy of things. My mom probably has it somewhere in her packet. Um, but it kind of goes a little bit more in depth into what this is, what they mean. Um, and like I said, if you want to get that book, Soul Types, that helps a lot with understanding more about all of this. Alrighty, so that's about personality types. Do you have any questions about understanding why we un want to understand our personality types? Hmm? We're moving on to passions. Oh yeah. All right, so what do I mean by passions? What's the first thing that pops in your head when you think of passions? Uh, what you're passionate about? What you're maybe? passionate about, yeah. That's a, that's a very 21st century interpretation of the word, which is also what we're going for, the things you're passionate about. Um, the funny thing about this word is if you look it up in the Bible, it is not what you think it means. If you look up anywhere in the Bible where it says the word passion, if you're reading like an English translation, they're referring to passions of the flesh, which are all kind of a little bit negative side of connotation. Um, which is, you know, good and bad, whatever. Um, so it uses it in mostly negative terms when it comes to passions of the flesh. But there is a term that the Bible uses that means passionate about things and is used in a good good way. Sometimes it can be used in a little bad, but it's the one we're looking for. Do you have any idea what that word is? We'll see if she knows. I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. It's 
the word used to describe Saul before he became Paul. He had a lot of blank. I don't know. Charisma? Mm. I don't know. Oh. Zeal. Yeah, You're probably okay. thinking you just looked over that word in the Bible. Oh, he had a lot of zeal. Oh, he was zealous about something. Whatever. Well, this is the word we're looking for. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> exactly. So whenever in the Bible you see the word zeal or zealous, now you know to think about what you're passionate about. And I'll go into a little depth there. All right, so zeal is used both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, right? So in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word kina, okay? Which you can find a good example of this in Psalm 69.9, which I have, and I'll read for you. Psalm 69.9 says, For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Mostly we're looking at the, for zeal for your house consumes me, speaking to the Lord. Um, and it helps us, you know, kind of use this word, which means intense passion, sometimes to the point of jealousy, can either be good or bad. Bad if it gets to the point of jealousy and envy. But it most often in the Old Testament is used to describe God's zeal, which is what God uses to accomplish his purpose. It's also sometimes translated when you see like the wrath of God. It's his zeal accomplishing what God wants to happen and what God needs to happen. The same thing can apply to us when it talks about, you know, we're so passionate about God's mission that we do something about it. It's an intense passion. In the New Testament, the word in Greek means zealous which in John 2.17 is he's quoting Psalm 69.9. Same word, same connotation, different languages. Zelos in Greek means to be fervent or passionate in a good or bad sense. Again, it can boil up to the point of jealousy or envy, um, which is not so good. But when it's good, it means excitement of the mind, a longing after, willingness, readiness of the mind, diligence, and forwardness. Which, when you kind of break these words down, it basically means to be zealous of something is to be outdoor, or again, that means passionate, in embracing, pursuing, and defending anything. When you're talking about the church, it's embracing your calling, pursuing understanding your calling, and defending God's word and your calling to spread that word again for anyone. It also is on the same lines as being all in and sold out. A lot of times in the 21st century, this word is mostly associated with no offense to older people, but teenagers who are very passionate about something in the church when they get the chance to be passionate about it. That's why we take them to mission trips and conferences and big concerts, because they get super pumped up about it. But that same thing can apply to anybody, no matter what your age is. You can get that pumped up about, you know, God and the Word of God and your calling in it all the time. Yeah. Amen. Hmm. Matthew twenty two thirty seven reminds us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. It's the same thing. It's not to be lukewarm for it. Remember, if you are lukewarm, God spits you out. You are either hot or you're cold, but lukewarm is not good enough. It's to put everything you have into it, to be all in, all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, which is why we're actually finding, figuring out our spiritual gifts, our personalities, because that's what our mind is, that's what our souls are, and you need to understand them in order to be all of them. Now don't get me wrong, I mentioned 
mentioned it earlier, zeal can be used in the wrong ways. Which is also why it's important to understand what our passions are in order to actively seek them out, in order to use them for the right and best ways. Because when we take the time to put our passions into something that we shouldn't be passionate about, then it becomes used for the wrong reasons. It can lead us to that intense jealousy and that intense envy and just going about things the wrong way. So by understanding what our passions are, we actually help kind of guide them towards the right path, towards God's calling. Again, by having it turn the wrong way, it can lead us away from what Jesus is commanding us. And so by knowing our passions and by setting out to fulfill our passions, we're actually help. It's like the bumper on when you go bowling. It's helping us stay on the path focused towards Jesus. Just as a little, you know, scripturally reference. Galatians 4.18 reminds us that it is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. Mm. One of the things I want to ask is the last part, not just when I am with you, what do you think that means? Why do you think that's in there? I mean, there are times during the day that um, you're not in tune with the spirit and so um, that's when we have to guard our hearts and know that our decisions our thoughts our actions will still please God um, even when we're not in his presence? Mm -hmm. I think to kind of go along with that, a good reminder that this tells me is that sometimes, you know, we're in the middle of a service and the spirit is moving. You know, we are all, we can feel the presence of God surrounding us and we get super passion, uh, passionate about what we're saying, what we're doing, and we set out to go and do what we're called to do. And then there are other times where, you know, we're kind of just in the motions. We, we go to church, we sit through the service, we're kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's a good one. Uh, and then we kind of go home and we're like, we'll do it again next week. The Spirit isn't as moving as maybe we would have liked it to, to really pump us up. And I think what this is reminding us is that we have those passions, we have the Spirit in us, no matter what. Whether or not the Spirit is seriously moving in the room around us does not mean the spirit is not there with us and that does not mean that we are not supposed to be just as passionate then as we would in those other you know moments where it's really gung-ho about things you know just because we don't feel god with us doesn't mean we're not called to be just as passionate right and i think we could also say that um, whether we feel like it or not, I think it's, um, we shouldn't let that get in our way of not being zealous, um, not spending time with God, not praying, not doing our devotions, not setting aside that time. I remember um, one of pastors, I don't know if it was sermons or something he put on Facebook, when we were meeting together, he talked about still making that time set apart for God and God only. Mm -hmm. Whether that was Sunday morning going to church or when that wasn't available, still setting aside that time that you made holy and it was only meant for God. He didn't want us, just because we didn't have church during some of those times this past year, um, didn't mean that we shouldn't still set aside that holy time to give to God, mm -hmm. to rest our 
minds and our spirits to spend that time with God and actually giving God that time, that day, that hour. Um, he didn't want us to lose that focus. Right. I think another thing about it, you know, remind us also that in the time, you know, with the pandemic going on, you know, Northside's been very lucky that we haven't had to close for months on end. We've still been able to meet for things, you know, socially distanced, you know, practice safety right. and everything. But there are other people who haven't been able to go to church, interact with, you know, their body of Christ, you know, their brothers and sisters in almost an entire year. Mm -hmm. And we still don't see necessarily the end in sight. We have mm -hmm. no idea if in, you know, a week or two, everything's going to shut down again and maybe we will have to close for months. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that's going to happen. And I think one of the things we need to remember is that even in those times where maybe we're stuck at home by ourselves, just me and my Bible, maybe no services online, maybe no nothing like that, we're still called to be just as passionate. We're still called to be just as all in and serving, even if, you know, the circumstances are just right. Yeah. You know, the circumstances don't have to be perfect in order for you to be passionate. You know, sometimes it's just about saying, hey, I'm going to be passionate about this. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do it. Part of being made in the Imago Day means our heart should break for what breaks God. If you, there's a song, I think it's Hosanna, that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Mm -hmm. And part of being made in the Imago Day means finding out what breaks our heart like it breaks God's. Now, not everything breaks my heart like it does God's, because some people, you know, have mm -hmm. different sides of God in them. But finding out what breaks our heart is a part of finding out how we're made in God's image. And we're made to respond to that differently. Yep. Our passions come out in different ways and at different times. Each of us created to make a difference in the world, one way or another. And so we're called to respond differently to those various needs. And that's what we mean when I say finding out what your passions are. Finding out the need that really sparks God's spirit in you should be the need that you're all in about fixing, about praying for, about serving. You know, there's there are needs, there are an infinite amount of, amount of needs all over the world. And one person cannot cover all of them. But the entire body of Christ can if we find out what our heart breaks for and we go for it. Now, there is no right or wrong temperament for effective ministry. You know, the things that I do doesn't necessarily have to be the, you know, the template for everyone. You know, you don't have to change how you do church, how you do service to match or look like someone else's. You don't even have to do that to look like your pastor. You know, who you are is who you are. The way you do things is how you're made to do things. Mm -hmm. And just because you're different than someone else shouldn't stop you from serving. It shouldn't be, you know, your excuse for saying, well, I'm not as good of a, you know, preacher as, you know, Pastor Tim is. No. No one preaches like Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim does. <laughs> and that doesn't mean you can't just be as effective in ministry and in service as anyone else. Being passionate for God by being passionate for the Word of God. Now, this doesn't just mean, uh, it does, you know, mean studying the Word, knowing what it says, committing that to memory, committing it to heart, but it also means the Word of God, which in, you know, we, John chapter 1 reminds us that that's Jesus. Being passionate about God means being passionate about Jesus, being passionate about living a Christ-like life life, plain and simple. Allow your passions to change you into being more of a Christ-like believer. When you set your mind to do that, all the other pieces start to fall into place. Alright, do you have any questions about passions? No, just opened my mind, my eyes up to some things, so thank you. All right, well, that's all I have for tonight. Um, just want a, a quick reminder about something. Um, 
if or when you get the chance to watch this on Facebook, I just want to remind you that I have hard copies of papers for you to use the next two weeks because the next two weeks we're actually going to sit down and take the assessments to figure out what your spiritual gifts are, what your personality type is, and to answer the question and to figure out what your passions are. So if you would like the test that I have hard copies for, let me or Pastor Dallas know so that we can put that in your mailbox or mail that to your address if you can't stop in in person, or even just email you a PDF version for you to use or for you to print on your own. I have all of those options. Um, there are online ones that you can use, and next week I will let you know if they are. Um, you can also just Google them. Um, I have specific ones that um, to show share with you online, because uh, some are better than others. So just clicking on the person you see might not always be the best option. But if you tune into the videos next week and the week after, we'll be going through kind of what that stuff means. Um, and I'm just going to give you time to just do those tests. And then hopefully you can let me know what your results are so we can come back week five and week six to really dig down deeper into those and actually plug those things into the ministries that are, you know, specifically here at Northside. So until then, I hope to see you guys next week or in a couple of weeks, whatever it is. Um, so until then.